Hi again everyone, this video is looking at the process of translocation which is the movement of assimilates throughout a plant. Okay, so first of all we need to recognise that when we're talking about translocation we can identify parts of a plant as being the source or being the sink, uh, but it can vary. So assimilates which are just substances that are synthesized by the plant. So sucrose is the assimilate that we would normally talk about. So uh, sucrose will move from what we call the source, so where it is synthesized, to the sink, which is where it is used either for storage or in metabolism. Uh, so that's the direction of movement for the assimilates. Now, the most common uh, way for this to happen is for the source to be the leaf, so the leaf is photosynthesizing, uh, making glucose, glucose is then converted into sucrose, and the sink is another part of the plant, for example the roots. So the roots can't uh, produce their own sucrose because they don't photosynthesize, so the, uh, the sucrose, the assimilate, has to travel from the leaf and it has to travel down to the roots. Um, Sources of as well, obviously, any part of the plant which is um, has a very high rate of metabolism, so any part which is growing, uh, things like flowers, for example, will be the sink. So, assimilates from the leaves would travel to places like flowers or fruits, um, buds, so growing parts of the plant. However, where it can get a little bit confusing is where you've got something like a storage organ. So some plants produce things like uh, potatoes, tubers, and these are storage organs. So as the sucrose moves from source to sink, some of that sucrose is stored in the potatoes, the storage organs, as starch. And then at a later point in the year, that starch is broken down into sucrose which means that the potato becomes the source. So although the sucrose isn't being synthesized from scratch, the breakdown of the starch into the sucrose means the potato is the source. And that sucrose can then travel from the potato up to other parts of the plant. For example, if you've got a plant which is growing new leaves after a winter period where it hasn't been able to do photosynthesis. So it could grow new leaves and therefore that leaf would be the sink. So sources and sinks vary, but ultimately the source is where the assimilates are synthesized and the sink is where the assimilates are stored or used. So what you can see here is that the assimilates, um, so the sucrose, could be moving in different directions in the plant. Sometimes they can be moving down, sometimes up, and they can be moving up and down at the same time and they move through the phloem sieve tubes. One sieve tube will only be uh, only have phloem sap moving in one direction, but if you've got two phloem sieve tubes next to each other, then they might be moving, uh, uh, the, the sap, the, fl the phloem sap might be moving up in one of the tubes and down in the other one at the same time. So, if we've got, let's, we'll just stick to the simple where the leaf is the source, so here is a cell in our leaf, okay? And here is a cell in the sink, let's say that's the root. So to get from the source to the sink, our sucrose has to first of all move from the source cell into the phloem. Then it has to move, in this case, down the phloem, but remember it could be up, but it has to move through the phloem. Um, these just represent the sieve plates and then it has to move into the cell at the sink. Remember that next to phloem um, sieve tube elements you've got companion cells and that's very important in this process. So what we're going to look at now is how sucrose is moved from the source cell through the companion cell and into the phloem. So this is the first part of translocation the movement of the sucrose from this part into the phloem sieve tube. Okay, so this is our, what we'll call our source cell. So this, could, for example, could be a um, 
palisade mesophyll cell in the leaf. There's the sucrose, which is being produced by um, photosynthesis. And then we have the companion cell. And there we have our phloem. You can see here uh, plasma desmata connecting the phloem and the companion cell. Now there would of course be plasma desmata between the companion cell and the source cell, but I'm not going to show them because they're not relevant in this part of the process um, and I don't want it to be confusing. So we're just going to leave them out. Okay, so the first thing that happens is sucrose moves from the source cell across into the cell wall of the companion cell. We do not need to look at how that happens. It just does. From the cell wall, that sucrose then moves into the cytoplasm of the companion cell. And once it's there, it can move by diffusion through the plasma desmata. So it just moves through the cytoplasm plasm into the phloem. So now we're going to look in detail at what's happening um, in the cell wall and the cell membrane of our companion cell as the sucrose moves across into the companion cell. Okay, so um, remember we've zoomed in here. So there's the cytoplasm and uh, the cell membrane. Now, of course, cell membrane is very, very thin. So that's what this represents. So this represents the cell membrane. And then we've got the cell wall. So all of that is our companion cell. Then next to the companion cell, we'd have our source cell. So we have the cell wall, the cell membrane, and the cytoplasm of our source cell. But because we're not interested in the detail of what's happening here in our source cell, we're going to just get rid of all of that. Uh, and we're just going to say that this is our source cell. And because it's a source cell, we've got lots of sucrose there. Now, our companion cell, um, just so we're really clear, of course, this is, a, this is a cell membrane. So what we've got here is a phospholipid bilayer. So that whole cell membrane there, of course, is a phospholipid bilayer. Um, and it's got the same structure as any cell surface membrane, which means it's got lots of transport proteins in it, which are very important for this process. In our companion cell, as with any cell, you've got lots of hydrogen ions or protons. Okay, so here we've got some protons. And what's going to happen is the protons are going to be moved from the cytoplasm into the cell wall of the companion cell. So they move through a proton pump. So this represents a transport protein. It's a protein pump. And the hydrogen ions are moved across into the cell wall. And of course, there would be lots of these proton pumps throughout the cell surface membrane. So the consequence of that is we end up with a lot of hydrogen ions, a lot of protons in the cell wall. And remember, this is the companion cell. So we've got a really high concentration of protons in the cell wall here. So because these uh, were proton pumps, of course, ATP was used. Because if you look at what we've got now, we've got um, a lower concentration of hydrogen ions in our cytoplasm and a higher concentration of hydrogen ions in our cell wall. So the proton pumps use ATP to maintain that gradient, protons being moved against the concentration gradient all the time into the cell wall. Now, with our sucrose, the sucrose is going to move across. And again, remember, we don't need to worry about how that happens, but just um, take it that the sucrose has moved into the cell wall of the uh, of the companion cell and we sort of want to think about how the process is ongoing so as part of the ongoing process um, we've got sucrose in the cytoplasm of the companion cell as well so we have to imagine that the process has sort of been going on for a while and what you can see with this diagram is that the cytoplasm of the companion cell actually has a higher concentration of sucrose than the cell wall. So just because of the way that the process works, even though the source cell is where the sucrose is made, because of this continual movement, we actually have a higher concentration over here. So our proton pump 
is maintaining a concentration gradient between the cell wall and the cytoplasm of our hydrogen ions. Because of the movement of the sucrose, we've also got a concentration of sucrose, but it's higher in the cytoplasm and lower in the cell wall. So what this green bit represents is a co-transporter. And the co-transporter will take hydrogen ions down its concentration gradient back into the cytoplasm. And at the same time, it co-transports sucrose against its concentration gradient into the cytoplasm. So the proton is moving down the concentration gradient and therefore it doesn't need any ATP. The sucrose is moving against its concentration gradient, but because it moves along with the proton, the way that this co-transporter works means that even though the sucrose is going against its concentration gradient, it also doesn't need ATP. So this is not active transport, even though the sucrose is going against its concentration gradient. So we end up with our hydrogen ions moving back and the sucrose going across as well. Okay, so we've looked at how we um, get our sucrose from the source cell across into the companion cell. Um, and then from there it's able to just move by diffusion in the cytoplasm into our phloem. So now we have to look at how we get um, our sucrose. So we've done that bit there. So how does it go from our phloem how do we get it to move down to our sink? Or remember, when I say down, it doesn't have to be down, but move along the phloem to our sink. So sucrose has been moved across into the phloem. We've seen how that happens. When we have sucrose um, at the sink, it can just move by diffusion into the sink cell. But we want to know how does the sucrose get from here down to here. Now, this is really important. I've drawn it like this because a common mistake is thinking that the sucrose just moves by diffusion because we've got a very high concentration of sucrose up here at the, uh, at the phloem near the source and because the sucrose is being moved out into the sink we end up with a low concentration of sucrose down here but it is not moving by diffusion the process is too quick for it to be done by diffusion so what we've actually got is something called mass flow you have to remember, of course, that the phloem is f uh, has also got lots of water. This is a phloem sap. So the sucrose here is actually um, it's a solute. It's dissolved in water. So the whole of the phloem has got sap in it, which is water with dissolved solutes and hormones and everything. So when we talk about mass flow, what we're actually talking about is the movement of, if you like, sort of a whole packet of the water with any dissolved solutes and they will move down uh, by mass flow like this. Okay, so it's not just diffusion of the sucrose, it's the mass flow of the sap, which is the sucrose uh, and the water and everything else. Okay, so um, if we go back and we will sort of forget the water for a second, so we know that we've got a uh, very high concentration of our sucrose molecules here. That means uh, that we've got a lower water potential compared to the surroundings. And down at the sink, where we haven't got as much sucrose because the sucrose is moving into the sink cell here, there we have got a higher water potential. So because of that, we get movement of water. But of course, low and high like that doesn't make sense because we know that we have the, the flow and sap moves from this way down to here and that's lower to high so that doesn't make sense so something else has to happen first next to the flow of course we've got the xylem and xylem doesn't have as many dissolved solutes as flowing so if we compare the area of xylem up here which is next to this area of phloem near the source the water potential of the xylem here is much higher than the water potential of the phloem. And we have pits connecting xylem and surrounding cells and the, the phloem vessels. What that means is water is going to move by osmosis from the xylem across into the phloem. 
And what that means, we need to forget water potential now. We're just thinking about how much water is in this area. You're basically flooding the area with water. You're adding lots and lots of water in. And if you add more water into a certain volume, what you do is you increase the pressure. So by adding this extra water, we increase the pressure, and it's called hydrostatic pressure. Down here at the sink, where we've got a higher water potential down here because we haven't got as much solute, what that means is that water is going to move into the sink. So the higher water potential here because we've got a lower number of solutes, and of course in the sink we would have a low water potential because that's where all the solutes have moved. So water moves from high to low water potential. And because water is being um, removed from the phloem down here, that means that in terms of pressure, there is a lower hydrostatic pressure. So hydrostatic just means pressure because of um, the water. So the result of all of this is we now have a pressure gradient. High hydrostatic pressure, low hydrostatic pressure. So that means that our flow M sap that we've looked at before, so our water and our sucrose, it moves from an area of higher hydrostatic pressure down to where there's a lower hydrostatic pressure. And that is the concept of mass flow. Okay, that's quite complicated. Um, I hope that makes sense. Rewatch the video if you need to, but that's all for now.